Okay, we are live and good morning, everyone. It's the Senate Transportation Committee and it's Friday and uh, we have a couple of uh, items this morning and next week I, I understand uh, we're going to get into the T-bill uh, and I think the House is finished with it. So we will start our, our overview of the, of the transportation bill. But uh, this morning uh, we have, uh, we're gonna talk about the Waterbury Main Street construction project, which seemed to me a very exciting project. I've seen pictures of it, but it was a major project and uh, they tore up all kinds of utilities. And it, it was a, I have not seen it since it's been completed or probably it hasn't been completed, but uh, with that, we'll have an update. And uh, who's with us this morning to give us that update? Uh, Ken, Ron, or Ron with us? Who is who is who is going to give us the uh, some overview this morning? Um, Senator Mazza, this is Ken Upma with the Vermont Agency of Transportation, and I uh, was acting project manager on this project. And also with me today is uh, of my staff is Casey Leach, who's one of my senior engineers, and he uh, he actually participated in the construction of this project. So. I was thinking that I would give you folks a uh, brief overview of the project. Great. Uh, and then uh, Casey so, uh, would follow. Ken, um, this has nothing to do with the project, but um, is Audrey up, was, are you related to Audrey up mall? Audrey, well, that was my mother. Okay. I was thinking that might be, um, um, I worked with her a long time ago. So I was thinking that perhaps it's not a common name that no it's not be. that my mom's been gone for a while now yeah uh-huh yeah thank you uh -huh. for asking uh -huh. um so why don't i just start I, I i didn't do anything really too formal here i don't have a powerpoint i got some i got a few uh illustrations i'd like to show you folks and like i said i'll, I'll do an introduction and kind of talk about talk about the project uh as a whole and then Casey Leach has sent some construction photographs and he can show, walk you guys through uh, a few of the various construction aspects of the project, okay? Um, so Waterbury Main Street, this was a, what we call at the agency an FEGC project. And what that stands for is Federal Economic Growth Center. And so the project really wasn't about, about safety or mobility. It's about uh, economic growth and uh, vitality for not only the for the municipality, but for the region. So really, that's that's where this project comes from. Uh, so it's a federal economic growth center. Um, this project's been under development for for years. It's it's what we call at the agency one of our legacy projects. Uh, I manage a number of legacy projects. I've been fortunate enough to deliver a bunch of them. And uh, I have a few more before I step off. Uh, I, I worked on the Barry City project, which is similar to this. And uh, US Route 7 in Shalott was a legacy project. Um, Pittsburgh Brandon Corridor, those are legacy projects. And um, Cabot Danville. So these are, these are large linear, full depth reconstruction projects and that what it, that's what it represents. Um, this project took an incredible amount of uh, effort uh, from an engineering standpoint to get it to, to construction. It um, actually had a construction cost of 26 million, uh, had a right away cost of about a million five uh, and spent almost three and a half million in preliminary engineering on the project for a total of about three thirty one point two million dollars So I think it's fair to say that it's probably the most expensive mile of highway in the state of Vermont. And it's all um, in Center Perchlick's district. Oh, that's right. Pardon that's me. right. There seems to be a lot in his district. He's He's got enough for the next 10 years. He shouldn't have anything, so. Yeah, but you've got that special bridge well, let's not go there, okay? <laughs> no, I was just going to mention that. It's very fancy. Uh, <laughs> okay. Gee, I think we're talking about Grand Isle here. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, Jane. I appreciate that. It's okay. Uh -huh. and, and they all, it's like Alice in Wonderland. They all shall be winners and all shall have prizes, right? 
<laughs> oh, my buddy Jane. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Doing so, my um, best, Senator Mazza, to add a little <laughs> levity to our otherwise. Um, is, it, is, the pro is the project done in Waterbury, or is it? I, I haven't been over there. It's it's practically done. Uh, all the all the base pavements laid. We've got some minor cleanup this year, and of course, for a project like this, you let the you like the sub base and uh, base pavement to settle. So we'll be uh, completing the job by. July 1st with uh, final paving, line striping, street lights, wow. et cetera. What uh, Liz, could you uh, please pull up that perspective of the, or actually, would you pull up the, the linear map of the project, please? Can, Liz, can you hear me? Yep. see it is that it well yeah. that's okay we'll do this one first oh wait, wait i got it hold on no this, this, is, this is fine uh no uh, liz the first the first the, the 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 map that i sent you it was called um i had sent you two yeah, i'll find it i'll find it. illustrations yes yep yep okay but if you want liz we can leave this map here for a second i'll just briefly yeah. go through this. It's going to take a minute. I thought, yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So this right here is a perspective of the, well, that's okay. What's the issue now? Do you see it? Well, no. no we're, oh, we're just geez. Hearing sorry. About. Yeah. I hate that. Mm. Share Can you not share your screen, Ken, and show it yourself? Liz, can you just leave that there for a second? That map you got <laughs> yes. right there? Yeah, and she can look for the other thing if she's sharing screen. And I, I got that too. But um, this um, this is a perspective of the project. Just I like the picture because it shows really what the, the stamp pavement is and the and the bulb outs and the crosswalks. So you see uh, what you got here is a, a downtown um, cross section of the highway. So you've got, but you'll notice it's got um, new sewer and new water. And he shows your sub basin, your under drain, and your new pavement. Shows your sidewalks, your street lights, your bulb outs with the stamp pavement. So there's just a general perspective of a of a cross section of the highway. Um, there we go. So uh, now, Liz, there was that other picture I had. Let me just. Um, um, It's going to take a moment unless you can share it yourself but i will look for it yeah, it was called waterbury map general yep it's going to take a minute for me to find it so okay. can you, uh, do you not have it can you share it i have it uh, let me see how do i share my screen here just click share screen and i'll look uh, for it in the meantime okay share screen yeah um just click share screen yeah now i gotta find them i gotta find the yeah i'll look too Oh. How'd you ever manage a project like that with all the traffic going through town? I mean, I just can't imagine tearing up the whole street. Wow. There we go. Okay, so um, on the far left there the, of, the, of that illustration, you can see the circle. That's the roundabout off the interchange. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and the, the project starts just beyond the brook, that little bridge on the right side right there. Yeah. And it extends, it actually extends easterly. And um, right there, you'll see it goes all the way down to a point um, just past the old Bean Chevrolet place. You can see the Waterbury State Office complex loop there as such. Now, <clears throat> Got a few things. Uh, this one of the one of the challenges of this project, of course, you know, the real challenge to these projects, I've always said, is not the engineering. You know, engineers, we don't have a hard time doing our work with respect to the engineering, but it's always the right of way and the utility and the environmental permits. Those I find those to be our greatest challenges. And um, just for this project, as a side note, it had 122 separate parcels oh my so God. 
it was the largest right away undertaking that I've ever experienced at the agency. And so, you know, we had to meet with every one of those abutters and discuss the project with them, listen to their needs and concerns and incorporate that. And then we had to value all those. And then we had to negotiate settlements with all those. And we did a pretty good job there because we only had one, one individual challenge us you know, minor alterations. Um, the utilities were, were a, a really big part of this project. It, it didn't really show the utility vaulting in that perspective, but because the, the town had a town ordinance prior to the project's programming, uh, it was eligible for federal participation to underground all the utilities and remove them. And so from the beginning of the project or, or just by the ball field, the rec field, all the way to the north, north access to the loop of the Waterbury State Office Complex, basically a just a little more than half the project, all those utilities were put underground. That was an incredible challenge for us. And then we maintained the poles from there to the end of the project. So, um, so Ken, does that mean that all the um, utility poles in Main uh, um, Main Street Waterbury are are gone? Okay, so there's the <laughs> there's the trick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because I know that you know, and well, I'll go back to the Danville project. It was incredibly expensive. They ended up just doing it for a segment of town. We've got huge boxes that, you know, our poor little library, I think, hosts about four of them. Um, and so um, uh, the desire to uh, put utilities underground was there, but it turned out it's so expensive. Um, it, it's just a little chunk in the center of town. So I was wondering what you were doing here. Well, as I said, we're, we are, we have undergrounded all the utilities. <clears throat> we've, we've built the infrastructure underground for all the utilities from the beginning of the project to that Northern access to the state office complex. And it was eligible for federal participation, you know, so the town only pays 2% of that. Um, and, but here was the trick and this was one of our greatest challenges. From a constructability standpoint, um, you could have put all the infrastructure underground, but then it takes about a year and a half or even more for all the utilities to run their stuff underground. I mean, we don't physically move their infrastructure from the poles to the underground utility um, conduits and vaults. That's their work. And of course, you'd have them tripping over the contractor, which would be a a, a real mess and it was a real challenge so what we came up with after about a year and a half of discussions was that we would the existing poles were in a position such that we could leave them <clears throat> throughout the, the primary reconstruction of the roadway and the sidewalks and then we would build all the underground infrastructure to host those utilities <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> And now that the, uh, the vaults are in, I think Green Mountain Power has moved most of their power underground, but now we have four or five other telecommunications um, utilities that need to move their work. And most importantly, Fairpoint, who would be the last people to move their stuff underground and then connect it and energize it all. So that's being done now as we speak. And when we get all done, or when the, this project is scheduled to be built and completed by July 1st, but you're gonna see utility poles out there that are in that area where they're supposed to be removed. And we're waiting for, we will wait for the utilities to transfer their aerial stuff to underground. And then they'll cut the poles. And then we're gonna come back next year and do a second contract where we just patch the sidewalk where the poles were and clean up. So it was a real innovative approach to doing this project because I don't know how we could have done it in a linear fashion 
with the utilities tripping over the contractor. So that was probably our greatest challenge throughout the design and development of the project. Um, Ken, what, what drives a project like this, Ken? Well, I mean, who, who determines that you're going to do a mile of road in, in, in the middle of Waterbury? I mean, does this start at the community level or does the state come in? And um, so what, what gets this project started? So oh, projects back in this time are all really developed or initiated through the regional planning groups. You know, the regional planners are who institute the program of, of projects like these, or at least they did back then. This project was probably promoted in the very early phases of my career, and I've been with the state for 28 years. Um, and then it gets programmed and it gets deemed eligible. And, and you know, that's what we've got. We've got all these, we've got all these, we've got these legacy projects that have been around. Um, in the roadway group and we've knocked out a whole bunch of them. I'm looking up at my list right now. I've got, I've got four more or five more to complete. I'm not gonna get them done in my career cause I'm gonna retire soon. But um, when they're done, you know, the agency doesn't have a whole, a, a whole uh, basket more of these to do. I mean, there'll probably be some corridor programming. You know, I, I've, I know there's interest in certain corridors on the national highway system, but you know this was all done back in the 80s when they programmed this stuff, and and they they take a, a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of time. You know they're not something that you can knock out like we do in our accelerated bridge program. It's the logistics to advancing a project with the utilities right away and environmental permitting is uh, quite a massive undertaking. Kind of wonder where sometimes we get the payback on some of these projects. It's not that the infrastructure doesn't need to have um, upgrades and, you know, we need to modernize and all of that stuff. But when you hear about um, when you go around the state and you hear about how retail is dead and everybody wants to still move out and, and all of that. Um, I just wonder if we keep up with the times on some of these. So, you know, if what was good in the 80s sometimes probably isn't good in the, uh, in the, in, you know, the late 2000s or early 2000s, but. Um, you know, it's a beautiful project. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It, it just, it's just a stunning project. So I guess probably that's what it is. It keeps Vermont looking more like Vermont, but I, I hope that uh, people can appreciate and businesses can appreciate and people can support a project like this by moving back into the downtown and, and wanting to be part of that. I, I hope that eventually that we see that. You know, I might add to that, um, that, you know, this is a, a wonderful thing for the town of Waterbury because they replaced all their hundred year old sewer. It's all new sewer, all new water. All that infrastructure has been replaced, all that utility work, you know, so it's, a, it's an incredible investment, but you know, it's an incredible product, but you know, this is, this is one of the remaining legacy projects that I've been fortunate enough to work on in advance. Yep. Similar to Barry City. Senator Perchlick. Yeah, Ken, on the wastewater reconstruction, so was that all eligible for the federal funds because it was under the state right away? No. What happens with the sewer? Um, I work with, with Federal Highway Administration, and typically because of, the, because of the proximity of the existing infrastructure, to the bottom of excavation. Um, if it's close enough to that, your construction activities will damage it. So that makes it eligible for participation. And I work with Federal Highway and got Federal Highway to go along. To, I think we had 65% of it that was close enough to it. And instead of uh, making the town pay for the other 35 cent 35% federal highway came in and decided to, to participate in the whole thing, so. Because that's an issue with a project in Plainfield on the intersection there. <laughs> Fortunately, it might, might create another stoplight for Senator Kitchell to go through on our way to Montpelier, but the, the cost of the, un, of the sewer lines and water lines 
for the town is pretty astronomical, but it seems like some of these projects, they get federal and some of them then they don't. So I'm trying to better understand when that yeah, is. I'd have to, I'd have to know more of the details. All projects are different. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna kind of try to wrap this up because I think Casey wants to show you some pictures, but I'll just add a few more things. You know, we coordinated our stormwater with the development of the state office, state Waterbury office complex and ran part of our storm water out, out to them around that north arrow and, and built a horseshoe receiving channel. And they actually built that for us. So that was kind of neat. Um, the construction phasing was interesting. The contractor, Jay McDonald, came through and used a different approach than we anticipated. And that just shows how contractors use their own innovative means and measures perhaps do things a little different but that worked out really good i don't i don't want to get into too much detail on that but that was really good and of course um i'm not sure everybody's aware of but one of our greatest challenges we would have uh, built this project a year earlier we were ready to advertise and we had to deal with all the development soil issues from the new the new laws that were made related to those and development soils being those soils in uh urban municipal environments that have the potential for, you know, um, solid waste, whatever. So we actually, the soils were the towns and it would have cost them probably millions of dollars to dispose of that soil under those new guidelines and requirements. And so we came up with another innovative approach and we kind of, bypass the, the need to go through that whole process by wasting those soils within the inter, interstate right of way. And if you drive around Waterbury, you drive between Burlington and Montpelier, Casey's gonna show you some photographs. We, um, <laughs> we disposed or we, we, we placed those materials in two separate um, or three separate uh, areas within the interstate right of way uh, to to accommodate those soils and you know the, the town of Waterbury didn't have three or four million dollars to get rid of that soil but we were we we're allowed to put it within our right of way because it's not going to be developed so that was really interesting um so um you know like I said this has uh, been a really incredible undertaking uh, I'm going to let Casey show you some photos but just before I close out here on what I wanted to say, um, I got to give credit to people that really never get much credit. And I really got to give credit to, um, there's a gentleman who works for the Agency of Transportation. His name is Tom Mancini, and he's the resident engineer on this job. And uh, this guy goes out there and, and builds a project like this day in, day out. 14 hour days. It's incredible the commitment they have. Casey Leach is gonna to speak to you, went out there and acted as the assistant resident and worked out there for two years, um, hundreds and hundreds of hours. And I gotta really give credit to Jay McDonald and uh, their superintendent, Matt Moran, uh, to go out there and, and deal with the logistics of getting this project constructed is amazing. So I, I just wanted to give a little credit to those folks in this forum because those folks never get much credit and they do a, a really outstanding job. So with that, Casey, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and, um, and, and give the folks a little uh, construction update. Hi, Senators. Uh, thank you for having us here. Um, so like Kenny said, I was lucky enough to work in the field for the past two construction seasons on this project. I did work um, a little bit with him and Stantec developing the final phase of the contract plans and going through the advertisement process. So luckily I was familiar with it beforehand. Uh, and I just have a few photos here that show kind of interesting uh, measures we took to help alleviate the issues that kind of arise with these big construction projects that are located right next to residences and businesses and uh, a massive corridor where you know thousands of people are driving through every day. 
Uh, so this one just kind of shows the phasing that we use during the paving operations um, and the kind of this is an all hands on deck operation. So basically, right before we pave, we do fine grading where we bring the sub base to the correct level and make sure it has the correct slopes with it. The super elevations are correct and everything. I wondered, is that bump sign, is that um, one that um, have that um, uh, um, the MUTCD um, would like? That is not. Um, I believe that one, the message is on the other side. Um, it, hopefully they weren't using it for the bump aspect of that, but no, it would probably not be MUTCD compliant. Um, good eye there. Um, and as Kenny mentioned before, this kind of shows the utility poles. Uh, the older ones are still there as well as the newer ones. So in this area, these poles are staying. So the kind of um, lighter brown are the newer ones where most of the utilities had already switched over to. And then the darker kind of gray ones um, we removed when we did the reconstruction of the sidewalk through this area. Uh, Kenny also mentioned the, uh, the dry utilities. Uh, so the electric and communication. We wow. had look at the bike. MP, oh, yeah. Huh. We had the electric company and then four different communication companies that um, that we had to run either the communication pedestals, which would be with what these are doing. Each color is a different uh, communication company, and wow. then these larger boxes are what the uh, the electric transformers. Um, sit on, and I believe Senator Kitchell mentioned earlier, those kind of that are throughout Danville already. Um, so Waterbury will have something similar. Most of these, we were able to kind of push off to the side a little bit more. And once the landscaping is in there, most of them will be somewhat concealed. Um, and they are kind of a duller green. So hopefully they kind of blend in as well. Boy, talk about coordinating things. Oh my God, I can't even imagine sitting down and figure this all out. <laughs> yeah. the the conduit was probably one of the trickier things uh, to sit and go down through, especially in the areas with uh, light pole based foundations or busy intersections where there's just a bunch of stuff going on. We had to do quite a few field changes um, just to make everything work. Uh, but luckily, like Kenny said, McDonald was really good and they were on top of it. And you get it all uh, all filled up and buried up and you forgot to put one in. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not, knock on wood. Oh my God. <laughs> Luckily part of it is uh, they run the strings through them, the pole strings for the actual utilities before they progress too far. Um, so not that it didn't happen, but luckily we, we caught any errors um, before they were in concrete. Wow. Um, these are just some more kind of um, riser poles for the conduit. So this is, right where the conduit would start coming up. Uh, so you can see these metal sleeves here. So these would all bend here and then come up the pole. And then they would start heading down toward um, Waitsfield. And um, you can see some of the issues we had with driveways because of course we have to maintain access to driveways that only have one entry or exit point. Um, so between digging the conduit trench, laying the conduit, and then these are all concrete encased. So you have to encase them in concrete and then let the concrete set before you can backfill. Uh, so were that all, takes more. Were, were all the businesses shut down during that time? Uh, the business on Main Street or they were able to stay open? Uh, they were able to stay open mostly. Um, wow. We, so if they were open, then we made accommodations um, either with ramps or walk temporary walkways to make sure that pedestrians could get in. Wow. Uh, some of them that only have limited access, they might've changed their hours a little bit. And as terrible as COVID was um, or is, um, a lot of businesses were either reduced because the state office complex wasn't oh, yeah, really right. at capacity. Um, so there was a lot of kind of downtime with the businesses. Yeah, right. Um, but here you can see we have metal plates with temporary driveways uh, to maintain access to all these residences and businesses. Um, people with large driveways or turnarounds like this garage here or the fire department was a great example because we can't obviously dig a large trench across the entirety of the fire department. Uh, you just kind of have to do that in phases. So you have to phase everything out. 
this was primarily what the uh, contractor submitted for their traffic control plan. Uh, we had a lot of stipulations in our contract plans about when they could do lane closures uh, for how long. Uh, one of the stipulations we had was they could only do kind of one lane closures from like nine to three because we really didn't want to uh, jam up school buses or the state office complex, which is a huge generator of traffic. Um, so during those really busy areas before nine and after three, we wanted two lanes open um, at all times. So they were had more freeing movement there. Um, but you can see the top one, this was primarily our sewer, which was on the right hand side of the road. And the bottom one was uh, mostly the sewer on the left, or sorry, the water on the left. Um, and then you can see we maintain two way traffic, two way traffic, and then they could just um, move the barrels because we typically use barrels or movable barricades. Um, during the daytime hours. And then if we had to, we would put concrete barriers up at night, but the goal was to have everything backfilled by the evening, um, primarily by 3 p.m. So we could have the two-way traffic moving freely without having concrete barricades throughout the entirety of the project. Uh, these just kind of show some innovative traffic control. When we got down toward, luckily the work by the roundabout was the second year. So we were able to uh, really get a rhythm going and get our feet wet and know what we were doing. And that's one of the reasons McDonald planned their uh, traffic control that way or their, their work sequencing that way. They didn't want to start in what they called phase one or two, which is primarily the downtown corridor because it would be so busy. Uh, so the, with the roundabout, we did um, require a separate traffic control plan. They had flaggers on every leg to kind of prevent gridlock from happening. And uh, the picture on the left is just a, a water line install. This is the new water main that's going in. You can see traffic moving on an alternating one-way basis. So this van is actually part of the live lane of traffic. And then the dump trucks would park next to the trench um, to take all the backfill and to bring backfill back <laughs> when they were filling the trench. And then of course the equipment is above the water line. And the one on the right is a live tap. When we got to the live um, water main that we were tying into on both ends of the project and some of the intersections, they used live taps so we didn't have to shut down large portions of the water system for an entire day. Uh, these really show the proximity of what we were doing to these businesses. Um, as you can see, this is a really deep sewer install and we were right at the entrance of uh, VSECU, Northfield Savings Bank. Uh, and ProPig is just right on this side as well. Um, VSECU, I think, did close down temporarily a few days um, just because you can see it's very difficult to get people in and out of there safely. Um, and we were lucky enough to have separate entrances down on this left-hand picture. Um, McGillicuddy's had a second door right here. And this walkway goes to a, a stairway that... Um, empties out onto Elm Street. So we were able to maintain traffic and go through there. We also use pedestrian flaggers. Um, this is one of them right here. So they would, their job was to move pedestrians throughout the work zone. Uh, they would be in hard hats and safety vests. They had all the safety uh, precautions with them, but they so would be is looking- the, is the, um, uh, Casey, is the light still there where Stowe Street comes onto Main Street then? This light? Yes. Uh, the new lights are in. So there is a new traffic signal there, yes. Oh, okay, but there's still, um, uh, that's still a, um, a lighted, there's still, it's still a signalized intersection. Yep, it's still a signalized intersection. They don't have the span wires anymore. It's their actual mass poles. Um, so they look a lot better, <laughs> I think. Um, but yes, this one is still a inter uh, signalized intersection. And then, um, down at the next intersection as well, not Elm Street, um, not Randall Street either. By the state office complex, that one is still signalized as well. That's a four-way signalized intersection. Um, I, I should tell the committee, I worked at the state complex from 1978 to 2002. Um, so I have pretty spent a lot of time in downtown Waterbury. And I can tell you 
You must have been 12 years old then. Wow. I must have been, but let me tell you, the uh, village of Waterbury is um, uh, compared to one uh, late 70s. The, um, it is just a beautiful village and uh, um, the houses are in much better condition and uh, um, the commercial district. So it's, um, it's been an interesting evolution to see, but that's a lot of time. Um, and that was back when the complex was not what it is today. So it's, um, it's pretty, um, pretty transformative. Uh, we did do a lot of work very close to buildings. As you can see here, this is the funeral uh, home that's right on Foundry Street. Um, this is, we're doing a water investigation right at McGillicuddy's. We had a leak somewhere, so they were receiving water in their basement. So we were trying to figure out if it was an old corporation stop. Um, because typically what the town would do when they had switched services, they would uh, either just crimp the copper, or they wouldn't necessarily shut off the corporation because then you'd have to dig to the main. Uh, so we, there was a lot of interesting live water services that were unknown when we were digging, <laughs> which made it interesting. Um, but they actually had customers here who were eating out there and they were very fascinated with the work that we were doing. <laughs> And then these are just some of the ramps that we kept uh, to have people gain access to their driveways. Obviously it was just a walk on. They had to park either at their neighbors or over at the, um, the town office complex. And we worked with the town really closely. Uh, we had meetings with them every week uh, with our public information officer, with the um, town public works director. So we were very, um, they worked very well to get the word out to let people know when we would be impacting their driveways or their water service, um, things like that. And especially for the driveways, it was a great sense of community because they would let their neighbors park over with them or um, they worked out systems like that between themselves, which worked really well. Uh, and then these are some of the, the new utility poles that were still kind of in the way. Um, as Kenny said, we can really relocate them uh, and they are newer. So we just had um, an item in the contract for bracing them. So that was either with excavators, as you can see on the picture on the left, uh, that was typically, that was used a lot to make sure that they wouldn't wiggle around too much during the excavation. And then the picture on the right, uh, you can see GMP for the more robust poles that had much more on them would come and hold them themselves just to make sure that there wouldn't be any issues with them. And then we do have a sand filter that's right outside of the uh, town office. It's buried down in the ground. It goes down about 15, 16 feet. Um, and they had to come up with this bracing system. We had originally thought it would be precast. Uh, obviously it's way too big uh, to ship a precasted item like that. Uh, so they did do cast in place. Uh, they came up with this bracing system so they could uh, pound those sheets down to the ground as they're excavating so they can just keep going deeper and deeper without having it collapse in. Uh, you can see some cars up here kind of for scale and then there's a guy standing down there who's roughly six feet tall so it was very deep down into the ground. And then with all the underground um, you know there's a lot of unknowns. The center picture is a drainage structure that they found right uh, kind of it was right across from the town office building actually. It took them about 45 minutes to dig it out of the ground. Um, we didn't know it was there. And the concrete was actually too hard. They couldn't break it with an excavator. So they had to dig all the way around it and take it out full, which was uh, pretty interesting. We do find a lot of pipes that we're not really sure what they're coming from. Uh, we try to figure out what they are, if they're still active, and then we would tie them into drainage structures as needed. And then the photo on the right just kind of shows an active water main. Uh, this was right at the end of the project. Um, the town had told us it would had, it had been shut off years ago. So we started to remove it and uh, the valves weren't turned completely. Um, and then it just kind of erupted. <laughs> and this was actually one of the first um, days that we were working with the water, which was very interesting because the town didn't exactly know which valves to shut off um, to make it stop. There was actually an old valve that they had kind of forgotten about that was off all of the latest plans, tucked away behind a building. Um, but luckily they found it <laughs> and shut the water off. Uh, but it made us well aware that we really need to know where valves are and make sure that they're accessible at all times when you're digging so close to live utilities. And that is all that I have. Where's the sewers disposal plant in Waterbury? Where is it, way on the other end or? Um, there's, 
I believe it's right by the roundabout. Oh, that's right. Um, it's not too far from the roundabout. Yeah. There's a couple of pump stations in between too. I know there's a pump station down by the hockey rink, uh, but all the sewer that we were dealing with was gravity and it was all kind of, it goes down Elm street and then goes kind of behind the houses um, toward the roundabout. Questions this morning. Great project. Wow. Really some project do right downtown. If you to get 122 people to, to work with you, all the homeowners. And that must've been a challenge right there just to, uh, because I'm sure you had to dig up a lot of front yards and, uh, you know, convince them that it was the right thing to do. <laughs> Man. Yes, go ahead, Senator Perchlick. I should know the answer to this, but all the granite curbing we see, like in, there are some in this project and a lot of projects we see that. Is it a dumb question to ask if it's all coming from Barry or is it, because I there was another granite project and I was, I found out that it's cheaper to import it than it is to, to get it, but I wondered if the curbing <clears throat> is something we're still getting locally. I don't think that's a dumb question at all <laughs> because that's uh, kind of what I had figured before I started uh, working uh, with these projects. There, I'm, I don't wanna be wrong with this, but I'm 99% sure it does not come from Barry. Um, I believe that there's a different type that they do or they don't manufacture that type of curbing or I think there's kind of a logistics reason why. Um, not just that it's cheaper because it, I'm they're going to go with the cheapest option, obviously. Um, but I think, and I could be wrong, but uh, I think Barry kind of produces something different than what they need for the curbing. Right. And do you could you find out where it does come from? Like, does it come from India or does it come from like Pennsylvania? Yeah, I can look into that. Um, I want to say it's New Hampshire. I know the curbing company is from New Hampshire um, that we're using, and they're. I know they did the Waterbury Stowe project as well. They're, I think they do most of the Vermont projects. Um, but yeah, I can look into that for sure. Okay. Thank you. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any sign that says Senator Perchlick project or anything like that. And so uh, I just uh, you know. I was so looking for Perchlick. It kind of looks like that bump sign. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I was I looking for Perchlick Lane. I couldn't see. Yeah, it. I, I haven't yeah. seen him yeah. anywhere in the pictures at all. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'm well, this sure was he, very. This, it was very disruptive to politicians during the election because there's usually a lot of uh, sign holding, waving at the roundabout or along right, Main Street. Right. But it's hard to do with all the trucks and beeping. And he know. probably will be there for the ribbon cutting when it's open. I'm sure. <laughs> I don't blame him. I don't blame him. I think of 31 million reasons why I would be. <laughs> well, that's an interesting project, and I thank you very much. Uh, it was. Uh, I often wondered about it. I got to go drive through there someday and see what it looks it, like now. It is it is a nice project. It looks really wow. great. Wow. Any questions this morning before we... Well, I thank you folks for a great job and uh, constructing that, putting all the pieces together. I just can't even imagine with so many uh, issues and businesses and homes to be involved and do a project like that. It's got to be really challenging and... Uh, Congratulations to everybody that all had a part in it because it's not easy when you do utilities and sewer and, and homeowners and lawns and gardens and everything you think about. So uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for having us. Thank well, you for having good us. Job. Good job. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.